Welcome to In The Pod. My name's Dave Jones and you have just found the podcast for technology vendors looking to do better marketing. Now today we're going to cover a topic that honestly we've really not paid enough attention to over the past few months and that topic is events. But to make up for us not having given that subject enough love recently, um, we're going big today. We've got a special treat for you. We don't have one we don't have two, we have three event professionals joining us from all over the planet. So without further ado, let me introduce Deborah Ward-Johnson of Revolution Events in the UK. Hi, Deborah. Hello, good evening. And also we've got Alison Lloyd and Joel Dunkel from Event Evolution Management in the US. Hello, guys. Hi. Welcome to you all. I'm really delighted that you can join us today. We've got an awful lot to cover when it comes to events. But before we get going too much, I want to give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourselves properly more than just saying hi. Uh, so let's kick this off. So, Deborah, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you work for and, and what type of events you run? Absolutely. So I'm one of the event directors at Revolution Events. So we are a boutique event management organisation. And uh, my job history was in sales, was in operations, was in marketing and all very customer facing. So everything kind of came together 16 years ago to ta da, this is the perfect job. Um, it's uh, it's great fun. Um, and we do a whole variety of events. So we do client based event. We do own brand event and we work in really different sectors as well. So that's kind of quite good to keep us on our toes. We work in information technology, record management. We look at uh, software solutions for procurement. We work in the physical construction, physical security, education. So a bit of everything. And when we talk about events, there are so many different types of events. So we do a breakfast meeting for 15 CEOs through to a massive expo with 500 exhibitors and thousands of people walking through the door. So uh, I wear many hats and have to remember which one's which. Brilliant. Uh, great to have you with us today, Deborah. Thank you for joining us. Alison, let's come to you. Same, same questions. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you work for and what you do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dave, for having me. My name is Allison Lloyd, and I am the VP of Conference over at Event Evolution. And I know that you and I met uh, for the Document Strategy Forum, which is an event that we launched in 2008. And it, this event is really focused, I think, especially for information management companies, they're really focused on creating content and managing content that uh, you know, organizations need to send critical information to their customers. And when we originally started the event, it was very document centric. But over the years, obviously, customer experience and how consumers, you know, get their information has really evolved. So it's really all about the mechanisms, the channels that customers receive that information and how we as information professionals really create dynamic content for them to consume that. And um, originally, we I was the editor of a trade publication that really talked about this, Document Strategy Magazine. And we lo launched the event, and really Joel launched the event. So I'm going to have Joel kind of talk a little bit about more about the event and how we create and how he created it. Absolutely, Alison. Great to have you here. And listen, it's it's nice to be interviewing you for a change. <laughs> Normally, it's you interviewing me. So great to have that. And Joel, sorry, last but by no means least, sir. Uh, uh, Alison's uh, giving you the the big up, so it's your turn, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks for hosting this. Um, and I probably speak for Deborah too. Like most of us, we stumbled into the trade show um, industry from different places, and I'm no different. Um, I, I basically made my bones picking up the phone, banging out 80 calls a day for a trade show company, and um, came from a marketing uh, background and kind of evolved into a marketing group show director, and you name it up the line. I know the business. There's from the operations registration, you name it, there's a lot of moving parts. But for the past 20 years, um, I kind of took my shot and started the event evolution, uh, unfortunately, uh, September 1 of 2001. So 10 days later, um, I watched, you know, as everybody else did what took place and pretty much told my wife that 
Well, I took my shot, but it'll never get off the ground now because I'll never have an event. And lo and behold, here we are 20 years later. Um, like Deborah, we focus on boutique type of events. Um, we really drive our, our events from its educational um, background. You know, we want to um, have a financially vested attendee sit in a classroom and then hold their hands and put them in front of a handful of companies that can help them apply what they're learning in session. And we do some pretty creative, unique things that um, I think have led us through some challenging times, the financial market crash, and then the last 12 to 18 months dealing with COVID. And we just finished our first event back in person two weeks ago, which I'm happy to say went very well. Um, so a lot of that has to do with, uh, I think, our formula, um, our brand name recognition in the industry, and more importantly, what we do from a content educational standpoint, which Allison and my my business partner, John, on the call, uh, Marl TD, um, drive it's it's really the backbone of our success um from a producing an event so that's that's my background kind of stumbled into it and here i am 28 years later 28 years later still smiling well that's a good place to be um and joel you mentioned covid we have to start the conversation today uh talking about covid it's one of the reasons why we've avoided talking about events until now because there haven't really been any physical events so joel to stay with you um what has the last 18 months looked like from an event management perspective, if that's not too um, crass a question? Well, they look like 20 pounds heavier, a lot of cigars, and a lot of uh, crying in my pillow at night. Um, look, we made a decision back in November of last year that, um, you know, we circled the team together and said, we are moving forward on in-person events. Um, I'm not a big believer in the virtual event world, and we can get into that later if you like. Um, I am a big believer in what happens in a face-to-face -face, um, environment. So we kind of set that bar back in November that we were going to move forward unless we were told um, legally we couldn't have an event via force majeure the venue and so on and so forth, that we will have an in-person event. So that's what we were focused on. We did not offer any hybrid learning with it. Um, and we can get into that as well later if you'd like. There was no virtual component of any kind. And what we found early on is that the exhibitors were hungry to get back. Um, our, our exhibit floor was sold out three months prior to the event. Uh, we had a waiting list of companies to get in. The bigger piece of the puzzle on our end is how was the professional attendee community going to react and what hurdles would they have to overcome if they wanted to come to the event that were outside of their control. And, you know, we surpassed our budgeted numbers. Um, I, I think I was mentioned you earlier, we did a market, a travel market survey to our industry which indicated uh, based off our 2019 numbers, we anticipated to be off 40 to 50% in attendance. And we were willing, um, and we shared that information. Part of our formula or success is there, it, there's no hidden agenda here. Our exhibitors are our business partners. They know everything that we are doing um, to help make an event happen successfully for them. So they know all our marketing before it hits. They know numbers before they hit. They get look at lists. So, you know, we, I'm happy to say we came in 28% down from 2019, which was a record show for us. Um, we did have some cancellations like everybody would, but it was not a rash of cancellations. And we gave everybody, we launched back in April, we opened registration, a no risk registration, which meant you can register, pay in full now when you register, you have until September 2nd, no questions asked if you cancel full refund, end of story. So I was holding my breath through September 2nd. Um, but when we got past that day, um, I knew we would, um, have a successful event on our hands and we did. Good stuff. Well, congratulations firstly, uh, for, for getting that, for making those decisions, for taking yeah. that strategic choice and getting there. Um, Deborah, I want to come to you now, uh, obviously the pace of everything is different on both sides of the Atlantic. What, what has the UK looked like over the past 18 months from, from an events perspective? Well, contrary to what all my friends think, I've genuinely never been busier, which sounds strange when all of a sudden it dawned on me that what we were selling was illegal. You know, you couldn't have mass gatherings. So we're thinking, cripes, where do we go from here? But you know, I'm really at the same school of thought as you, Joel. We, we looked at all options and as Revolution Events, we run, as I mentioned, different events in different industries. And we had to look at each event throughout the calendar and look at which industry it was in. So some of those we have been able to drop into a virtual format and it's worked. Some of them 
we just know it's not going to work. And, you know, obviously we know each other, Dave, through AIM Forum Europe. And that was one of the ones where we looked at and we thought, actually, our passion is delivering an event where it is all about collaboration, peer to peer networking, vendors and end users in the same room, creating those relationships, which is just face to face. So we've had to take some really hard decisions about picking the event up and moving it. I, I call it a cut and paste. But of course, when you move any event, there's so much work and so much communication you have to do. Um, for us, it's been a real shame because we're all in it for the love of actually seeing the magic happen. That's what we do. Um, so it's it's been hard, but we are now starting to feel the buzz. We're starting to feel the vibe again. Um, I'd say probably in the UK market, people are still quite hesitant. I'm really sorry. My dog is making a lot of noise over there. Um, we They're starting to be cautious. So we're looking at ways we can make events even safer. In the UK, the government are saying we don't have any regulations on events at the moment, which is fine. If you want to go ahead down that road, we're a little bit more cautious. Probably, you know, personally, I was a shielder, so I wasn't allowed to leave the house for months and months. So it, it does make you look at things with a very health and safety eye. But you have to think, I don't know the behind the scenes story about every end user that's walking through that registration or every delegate that's on a stand. So we've got to make sure that they feel comfortable, which has led to us having to pick up events and move them to a safer timeline again, unfortunately. But I think the question is, we're nearly there. But the question is, when when are we going to be ready to stand on the exhibition floor or information market floor or in that keynote room and think, this is going to happen. The magic's coming. It's coming. We're, we're, we're close in the UK, maybe a little bit behind the US, but we're, we're getting there. But if you've got a venue with windows that open everywhere, we're fine. I mean, I don't think the Labour Party venue had windows, but hey, they did a grand job. Good to hear. Um, and one of the things that, that Joel mentioned uh, that I want to talk to you about, if it's OK, Alison, is the concept of hybrid events. Now, obviously, I, I talk to a lot of marketers. We do a lot of marketing consultancy and services for, for numerous technology vendors. Marketers have, have been hit hard with events going. They were a great source of leads coming into the business. Um, everybody moved to virtual events and everybody got fed up very quickly of virtual events. So from a marketer's perspective, hybrid events seem to be the best of both worlds. Um, what's it look like from an event management perspective though? Is it the same reality? I think for a hybrid events are really complex endeavors. And when you really look at it from an event manager's perspective, I think you really have to look at your goals. So Deborah just made an amazing point about the fact of you have to really look at your attendee base. What are they coming to the event for? And so, for example, like Joel and I have really um, kind of explained our events are really peer to peer discussion, education focus. We're not talking about having a lecture and it just be kind of one direction. You're really getting into this feed feed, you know, feedback loop. So if you're thinking about hybrid and another thing that we discovered when we we're doing virtual events, kind of just to bridge this gap, right? One thing we really, really, really learned was this marketplace or virtual platforms is nascent. It, it is really immature. And no matter, you know, like you talk to technology vendors, especially these event um, technology platforms, they're unfortunately learning along with us. And for all these years that we've been doing events, the technology is just not really at the place that I think that we need to be. And so if you're looking at hybrid, you have to be really realistic about where that technology is, how you're going to leverage it, and what your attendees want from this hybrid nature. And I think hybrid is really great if you want to reach the global world. You want to really ramp up the accessibility and how many attendees you can really draw in. But if you're like us and you really are into connections, really learning from each other, 
I think hybrid um, can be a complex endeavor with not great ROI, given the nature of the technology marketplace that we see today. I, and if I just piggyback on something sure. else you said, you know, from the hybrid standpoint, you get a couple of hurdles. One is the cost to produce a hybrid event, um, which is extremely high. Number two, are you then given a potential attendee who was on the fence about physically coming to an event or reason not to come to the event? And um, you cannot charge, you know, our, our cost per attendee uh, is about $1,200 per head from an educational standpoint, then factor an airfare and hotel. They have a financial commitment anywhere, let's just say in the three to four grand range when you factor everything in. You can't charge uh, a hybrid attendee the same dollar you're going to charge somebody who's physically on site. And our formula is, look, you, you get yourself to our event and we will take care of the rest. You don't worry about anything. You'll be fed. You'll be entertained. We will do it all for you. Um, the hybrid side of it doesn't really work that way. So if I'm going to tell somebody who's sitting in their office in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, um, look, our event is in D.C. We want you to fly out and come spend three days at the event. Or you can sit in your office and spend $299 and watch um, sessions online if you prefer. It, it doesn't, it's not where we want to be, um, number one, because it gives that audience an option. And number two, that cost of producing that hybrid content, as Allison mentioned, the ROA just isn't there for us. Um, and, and the last part of it that I'll touch on, and maybe Deborah um, has a different view of it, the fact of the matter is this, the exhibitor community, which carries most of the financial burden of virtual or hybrid events as sponsors or exhibitors, wherever they want to classify that, they don't get the value from these things. Um, it's just, I don't care the bells and whistles behind it. The exhibitor community has gotten smart now. They realize having a virtual booth with little uh, men walking around and, you know, just the bells and whistles, they're not making that connection they will do at a show face to face. It's not the same. They're asked to man a virtual booth, if you will, for four or five hours and three people stop by. Um, so they have gotten smarter, which makes it a more difficult sell because the funding for it is not going to be there like it was before. And the attendee community, in my opinion, cannot carry the financial weight of that by themselves for what you will charge for a virtual or hybrid platform. That's just my opinion. I think that that's great to hear. Um, it's certainly the sensation from the other side of the fence is that the experience that you get with with even the best virtual event is incomparable to to an in person event to a real event. So, all right, let, let me flip that on its head a little bit if I can. And Deborah, I'm going to throw you the difficult one. Um, if that's what a bad event looks like or not a good event looks like. Um, what makes for a good event in that case? And I mean that from your perspective as event management and event planners, uh, but also for the attendees and the sponsors. For, for me personally, I know it's a good event by about 10 o'clock in the morning. You, you just you feel it. You know, it doesn't matter how many numbers you've got down on that list of attendees. It's whether they're coming through the door. Because ultimately what we're creating is, is a forum where vendors are meeting end users. So for me, it's when I start seeing those conversation happen, when I start seeing the engagement. And I think, you know, you're right, Joel, that's just not what we're gonna get in a 2D world. It needs to be 4D. It needs to be touching all the senses. We're, we all buy from people, right? If you have a dog, how many strangers did you talk to when you were walking the dog during lockdown? It's about that magic. So, yeah, if for me, it's about seeing it happen and you, you can feel it happen as well. For the attendees, I think a good event is something that's giving them some kind of learning outcome that's educating them. So, for example, with every session that we would have at an event, we ask the host, whether they're a vendor, whether they're an industry specialist, whether they're Dave Jones, what are your three learning outcomes that you are offering the audience? You've got to give them some kind of value. So that that is what we really want to tick their boxes with. If you're an attendee, 
you also want to meet people like you, people that have got the same pain points as you. So facilitating introductions to people that might be in a similar job role or a similar industry kind of makes those people create their own little networks and maybe not feel so alone. I mean, particularly in the information management side of life, sometimes those roles are really isolated and they need those peers to bounce off. Um, and if you're a vendor, well, it's about the engagement that you're getting on the day. We can give you a list of everybody that you've scanned on site, but if you've just scanned them and you've not talked to them, you are really not going to get masses of value. So actually what the last 18 months has given us is an opportunity to really talk to our vendors and go, right, let's talk about your strategies. Let's talk about what are you trying to push? What can we get out there? You give us the tools. We'll get it out to our ecosystem. But also it's a bit of bit of guidance, really. I mean, I've been in this role for 16 years. You know, my MDs have been, I won't say how many years they've been doing it, but we've all got between us all, we've got this wealth of experience of things that we see on site, things that work, things that don't work. So we're having those opportunities to talk to people about that. And if people can really focus on who they're speaking to, yeah, I might scan Dave Jones and then I know I've got an Excel document coming with Dave Jones email. But actually, I'm going to write down Dave Jones, the guy in the cowboy hat. So as soon as I see his name on a spreadsheet, I'm going to go, oh, yeah. And we talked about this. We talked about that, we talked about his kids. So actually, when I'm following up, it's not just about that one day. The follow up actually is going to be really bespoke. So and the secret is having really good people on your stand. And that could be not the techie guy, not the saleswoman. That could be your receptionist. I've seen that before. There you go. Some great insights. I'm I'm disappointed that you don't remember me walking on stage to ACDC's Back in Black. Oh, all you I'm remember. Sorry, it's just the cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Alison, I, I you're, you're itching at the bit to get in and, and yeah, come up. So I, I was hoping you were going to call on me, so I was like, please call on me. But you know, Deborah, you really haven't, and I think of it as like this alchemy that happens at events, right? Where it is like all these moving parts that really mix together to create engagement. And I think, you know, we all can talk about numbers, how many attendees, how many end users. We can create all these kind of demographic profiles of what we think is a successful event. But it's something that you can feel in the air, and that is to do with engagement. And that engagement has to be on all these sides, right? Your attendees, your speakers, your exhibitors, and, and your staff that's working the event that really kind of create this community. There, and I know that, you know, with a lot of events, maybe even a lot of times association events, but for our events who are, you know, really peer driven, it's this sense of creating this safe space. It's not, I have talked a little bit about it before, it is not just this one direction kind of lecture. We're really having dialogue. And that dialogue needs to happen between your peers, between your solution providers, between experts who would come into your organization. And I think that creating that kind of environment where you are feel open and free to discuss, these are our challenges, and this is how we are solving them. Not that every answer is the right one, but having different kinds of approaches. Look, we've all been, I know, we've all been to events where they're just selling us information. But even as attendees, as an event manager, when I go to events or I go to event conferences, I really want to know, well, how did you do this? How did you approach that problem? And I think having that perspective when you're running events and creating these really interactive environments, I think that's the real thought that we really need to focus on. And from especially solution providers points of view, I'll let Joel go next because he has this great saying about not selling a piece of concrete. But from an exhi exhibitor point of view, I think they need to understand that you know, going in it, in it from like a straight sales perspective, that's just so one dimensional. I think knowing, you know, 
look, we all understand you have a million events that you go to all year long, right? But if you don't really understand what kind of event you're going to, like what's the vibe of the event that you're going to and understanding who are you going to see and going into it more of I'm there to learn. I'm there to meet really interesting people. And you know what? If I get make a connection and make a sale out of it, that's a home run for me. But understanding how you're going to engage in the event, I think the too many vendors and exhibitors don't do enough of that interacting um, over this like straight outcome that they're desperately seeking for. Joel, follow those two. Uh, anything to add to that? Well, yeah, listen, as I said, I think I've been in the industry 28 years and when I decided to take my shot, you know, there's a traditional trade show formula that the big boy companies operate under. Um, and if you think about the trade show world, you have your exhibitors, you have your attendees, and you have your event producers, which are what we do here. Um, at most traditional trade shows, 80 to 90% of the revenue is being driven by your exhibitor sponsor community. Okay. If you look at what they know about what's going on, they are the least informed people at the show by design um, from the big boy companies because we don't want them to know too much. We want them to get there, set their booth on time. We want them to make sure their payments came in on time. We want them to re-sign before they leave this show for next year's show. And then ultimately we're gonna try to sell them more concrete for the year after. Um, and we're going to leverage every one of their competitors to scare them into a bigger booth or be in the show or what have you. So I don't know if you guys uh, remember the movie Jerry Maguire. Uh, I know Allison's probably going to roll her eyes here, but, you know, Jerry got fired. He was a top agent, but he got fired because he decided to put the client ahead of the company, the client's needs ahead of the company's needs. And I'm sitting there working for a large trade show company, and I'm listening to what I'm telling exhibitors and this and that. I just said, you know, Everything seems backwards. I mean, I, I'm sharing this stuff, but there's no bearing on their success. I'm just throwing out numbers, throwing out this, scaring them to do that, pressuring them to do this because, God, Pepsi, how could you not be in a 50 by 50 booth? Coca Cola's in a 50 by 50 booth. Um, so I looked at it and I said, you know what? There's a different way of doing this. And I reversed everything that I was taught over the years when I started the company. And we did some, some strange creative things that are now, I think, gotten to be more mainstream that we've been doing for 20 years. But it, it is a partnership between attendees, exhibitors, and media event producer. And if those two other parties are happy, then at the end of the day, I'm going to be happy. I can't be happy and have both of them not happy financially, because then I know I didn't have a good show. Um, so just a different way of looking at it. But to Allison's point, it's, you know, I would venture a guess, even in today's trade show world, 95% of the exhibitors don't track leads. If they track them, they only look at, oh, we, we scanned 67 leads last year. This year we had 73. It's a better show for us this year. They don't follow through the pipeline. They don't know where it came from. And the other part of it is, you know, <clears throat> you have an exhibitor staff that is going from your show to another show next week to another show two weeks from then. What is their main priority? Did our booth ship here in time? Do we got to get it set up between these hours? What are show hours? I got to pack it up and where do I have to send it? Oh, I got to send it to Dallas now. I got to move it. That crew is going from one show to the next show to the next show. They're not looking at you like it's a relationship that has been built over 12 months. Because when somebody asks me what I do for a living, I have a hard time explaining. I said, well, think about getting married in a wedding. You got to hire the florist, the, the band, the venue. All of that takes 12 months for one day. Everything we do here, and Deborah, you mentioned it, the magic happens in three days. And you will know right away whether that magic is happening. So, but that magic has to happen with everybody, not just us, the event producer, because you're gonna fail that way. And that's the tact we took when I started this 20 years ago, is that uh, I am gonna share everything with our exhibitor community. And whether they like to hear it or not, if our numbers are down, they're gonna hear it. Um, they're going to see a marketing piece before it ever goes to print. And they're going to know what list I'm mailing to. I want them to know what I'm doing on their behalf because their success is my success. And that's how we've tackled it. And um, I'm happy to say the relationships will carry you through 
uh, and Deborah, you can speak to this. For some magic reason, if you burn an exhibitor on a show, there's a three-year wait period for whatever reason to come back. I don't know where it started. I don't know why it's there, but um, they seem to give you a three-year sit-down until they prove to them that you're back doing what they want you to do. Um, yeah. We've established relationships, and those relationships have carried us through a lot of tough times over the last 20 years um, because of what we do. To me, what happens at the two or three days of the event is icing on the cake. That's that's the work you put in for the 11 and a half months leading into it. And that's how we've kind of educated our communities um, that, you know, all the things that we have done to position and generate uh, opportunities prior to you ever stepping foot on the show floor is what your value is. Now, it's up to you to create that at the physical event and do what you're supposed to do. Don't sit in your booth reading a newspaper or looking on your phone when people are walking by, boothmanship and all those different things. But it's about um, creating that, as Allison said, and interaction. Um, we can create it. It's up to them to take it down the road. Fantastic. Uh, Sorry, Deborah. Sorry, I was just going to jump in there and I, I completely agree with everything you're saying there. I, goodness, we're like peas in a pod. Um, one of the things that we were doing just pre-COVID when we were still running events was actually we were um, having video calls with the sales guys that were going to be on the stands because I can talk to somebody in marketing and I can talk to them about the numbers. And like you say, we're really transparent as well. We we want people to have realistic expectations, but also, you know, we're encouraging them to work hard. Um, but we realized we can say that to marketing, but the marketing director is not the person on the stand. It's actually like you say, it's somebody that's going from event to event to event. So we've got to get them vested. We've got to get their interest peaked. We've got to get their passion riled up. So, yeah, just by simply having video calls with the guys or the girls that are going to be on the, the stand, it's helped us have that level of communication rather than just turn up on the morning and go, oh, OK, you're the guys on this stand today. Nice to meet you. So developing those relationships a little bit further, helping that marketing contact generate some real enthusiasm from the sales team. So and, and you know, we're all used to video messaging now. So it, that's long may that last. That's so cool. Great conversation here. Sorry, and I'm going to cut Alison off now. Alison, no, no, I was just saying that's a that's a really cool approach. Yeah. I was just about to say we're having a great conversation here today with Deborah Ward Johnston from Revolution Events in the UK, Alison Lloyd, and Joel Dunkel from Event Evolution Management in the US. Um, I'm going to get you guys to do a quick fire round now. We're going to go quiz show style. Um, and I'm going to start. This. <laughs> I know, didn't tell you this before we started. This is just to wrap up. Let, let's get you guys. Let's get the adrenaline pumping. In two or three sentences, Alison, um, how should? Uh, well, uh, let me let me preface this a little bit. There's an awful lot of new companies that have come into certainly the information management space over the last couple of years that have never been to a physical event. Mm. What advice would you give them, Alison, on choosing which events to attend? Well, OK, this might be a little biased, but um, I really am really passionate about events that are outside of the box. If you're a new company, especially in this information management marketplace, I think you should choose events that really involve connecting and also choose events that aren't so siloed information management companies and that function are very siloed you want to choose events that are horizontal and connect to many other functions so you can meet those other individuals who sit in those functions that connect to information management Great answer. Joel, I've got to come to you with this one, given your comments about selling tarmac. Um, uh, what advice would you give to people about selecting a booth or a package for an event? Let me give you a real world uh, uh, example here. I used to produce a um, large sensor technology show back in my former life. And every company out there was a sensor, semiconductor, you name it. And I'm walking down the aisle, there were 325 exhibitors. And I noticed a small 10 by 10 had little rubber O-rings. So it caught my attention. I walked up to him, and I still remember this. It was probably back in 2000, or no, 1997. Um, I said, why, why are you guys here? I'm just trying to 
understand your tie-in. She goes, well, Joel, every sensor that gets mounted on a CPU board needs our O-ring. So, and, and like a light bulb went on. This was one of the reasons that got me to Event Evolution. The light bulb went on my head and I said, oh my God, that's brilliant. I said, um, do you mind? She goes, this is one of our best shows. I said, do you mind giving me a quote? And then she said to me, I do mind. I will not give you a quote. And I kind of was put off a little bit. I said, can I ask why? You love the event? You, you know, because I don't want any of my competitors to know I'm here. Um, she had she had the event to herself for what they did. So my advice is, number one, I touched on it earlier, don't follow the leader. Um, you know, if, if you think about a strip mall, they get the anchor store in first. So the Macy's or the Nordstrom. And then the other small stores that think the clientele of that big store is their clientele will then fill in these smaller spots. I I would tell, uh, I know I'm going more than two sentences, Dave, so bear with me. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> you know, you know it, it's it's about the market, about who's attending, demographics. It, no show is 100% hit for you. Um, you know, our document strategy forum event is primarily financial insurance. You know, we have healthcare, we have some other areas, but the bulk of our attendees are or that, and their titles cross over a wide range of, depending where they sit within the enterprise. Don't follow what your competition does, because a lot of times the competition will just do, if they do 20 shows a year, that's what their budget is, they're doing the same 20 shows. The risk reward for a marketing person or a trade show marketing person to go out on a limb and select an event they never did before and fail, shows up a lot worse than select an event they never did before and it works. They don't get the credit for having it work, but the egg on the face for picking something that failed is where it is. So my advice to companies is don't be hung up so much on what your competitors are doing. Understand the audience, understand the focus of the event and how that fits with what your marketing message is or what you're trying to connect with. And if you can find an event, and I'll leave it with this, my, my classic conversation with people would be, Look, if you identify with 30 or 40% of our audience and none of your competitors are there, what the hell are you waiting for? This should be a home run for you. And that's how they ought to look at things. Just because 15 of your competitors are there doesn't mean you need to be there, despite the pressure that you're going to get to be there. Um, so find those diamonds in the rough that speak to a segment of who you want to meet. And if your competitors are not there, more power to you. Fantastic. Makes perfect sense. And Deborah, I've saved the best one for last for you. Um, what advice would you give people about creating their booth artwork, their collaterals, and most importantly, their swag? Oh, 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 I can do this one. <laughs> we have created the ultimate guide to exhibiting. So, you know, just a little something we did during COVID. Um, but again, it was about pooling our knowledge and we actually send that to all of our exhibitors across all of our events. Um, and, and it is, it's kind of looking back at everything that we've looked at. So when you're designing your booth, um, most of what we do is shell scheme. So you've already got your dimensions and you play with those dimensions. Um, you've got options of pull-ups, pop-ups, flat graphics, etc. Any one of those is going to work. Like the receptionist I mentioned earlier that used to come to the event had one tatty pull up. Didn't matter. She talked to people. She had a great event. Um, but so in terms of artwork, I think think simple. Um, think not too much text and please do not put your text anywhere below your waist because it's just not going to get seen. You're going to have chairs, you're going to have bags, you're going to have laptops and stuff like that. Um, so definitely consider your artwork always being waist up high. Um, booth wise, I think interactivity gets people involved. Used to be tactile stuff. Not sure in a post COVID world how that's going to go. I'll tell you next week. We've got a big event next week, so I'll tell you how that goes. Um, but, you know, people used to like to touch. We have one event where someone used to bring loads of different types of AstroTurf just so that people could rub it. But they would stand there talking whilst they're rubbing this AstroTurf. Um, <laughs> the interactive element the competitive element as well humans love a bit of competition so have something like maybe um i mean we've had people with exercise bikes how many miles can you do in a minute we've had um i think it was like the crystal maze where you go in a tube and it's got all the little confetti but you've got to pick the one color 
And the the guys that were on the stand, they all made loads of noise when somebody was doing their one minute. So all of a sudden, all of the other delegates are going, what's going on over there? Let me go and go and have a little look. Think outside the box. Uh, one of our best stands at an event recently, well, I say recently, it was just before COVID, um, had a boa constrictor on it, very outside the box. It, it matched their marketing strategy and their logo. Yeah, but you know, so many people came because they were like, I want my photo with a boa constrictor. All of a sudden, all over Twitter, Instagram and Facebook is that boa constrictor with that company's logo behind it. So great, great kind of thinking outside the box. Collateral wise, please, can we save the planet? Flyers, okay, you can get a lot of information out there, but you are killing the trees. Um, give a USB. Give a branded USB with your information on it. And swag, everybody loves a little swag, whether it be a cowboy hat or we recently had for our inf one of our information management events, someone's putting socks in the delegate bags that have got pictures of cookies on them, right? That would mean nothing to my husband, but of course we all fell about laughing. Oh, how funny. So kind of, yeah, thinking outside the box in terms of don't go old school, go new school. and you know, your, your socks can be made from recyclable materials. It could be branded bamboo cups and stuff like that. So think about what kind of image you're trying to project as a company. How do you want people to see you? And that will kind of come out in what you're giving. I knew trying to keep you guys to two or three sentences was going to oh, be yeah, a, I forgot that bit. <laughs> so much great information coming in there. I think it's the first podcast. It's the first session I've ever been in where we've talked about boa constrictors selling tarmac and stroking astroturf so <laughs> on that note um i'm going to say thank you so much deborah allison and joel Th thank you for joining us today it's been an absolute pleasure thank, thank you dave. thank you no problem at all you've been listening to in the pod my name's dave jones and until next time we'll see you again <laughs>